Welcome to the Lathia Bible Fellowship. Today's sermon is on the uh, pride of life notoriety, specifically looking at the talents that we've been given and how it is that we use those and invest those things. Hopefully you find this, uh, you know, just a good experience for you, something that uh, will teach you. And if you want to know more, we do have more information available on our website at uh, abfpdx.org. And uh, hopefully uh, this finds you well. All right, so we'll begin uh, like we begin uh, every sermon with just a word of prayer uh, before we hear God's word today. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity again to be gathered here together uh, to hear from your word. I pray that uh, we would be listening intently, that your spirit would speak to us and we would hear exactly what it is that we need to hear. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together and to hear your word. We thank you for that freedom and pray that we would not take that for granted, Lord. I pray this in your son's name. Amen. All right, so uh, just a bit of a recap, of course, this month we've been talking about the uh, pride of life, specifically in regards to notoriety. Last week we talked specifically about achievements versus notoriety. We went over the story of Joseph. Um, and I did mention his amazing Technicolor dream coat, but only in passing, and uh, I think that was enough. Uh, but uh, we're going to continue. Uh, we're going to use Joseph as a springboard. Um, since we used him as a, compar- a comparison, we're going to follow where that leads us today. And for this week, um, I want to talk about our own achievements. I want to talk about our own talents, things that we are being uh, given. Because uh, that definitely, whether we uh, think about it this way or not, that leads uh, to a bit of notoriety. It becomes what it is that we are known for, uh, the way that we do things, the things that we're skilled at, uh, the person that we become as we grow, as we mature. It uh, changes how people understand who we are. And we have opportunity then to utilize that uh, for God's glory. So specifically today, I want to talk about how and why we invest our efforts, our skills, uh, our talents, our courage. Uh, As I was pondering this, thinking about it, uh, my mind was drawn back to last year, actually, because we talked about blessings last year. Uh, We had a focus in 2020 on blessings, uh, taking a proper account of those, uh, weighing them, giving proper value. Uh, to what it is that we've been blessed with. So I had the opportunity to look back through our sermons from last year, and uh, I was drawn uh, to one, uh, well, I mean, it was, it was in July of last year. That was my month. So I was drawn to my own sermon, which, quite honestly, it's never happened to me, and it was joyous to be able to see something that I wrote. Now, if you know me, writing is not my strong point, but it was a joy to see something that I wrote inspire me to write more. This has never happened before, guys. This is a momentous occasion right here. I was inspired by something that I wrote to write more. It's amazing. Maybe someday I will be known as a writer, but it is definitely not going to happen immediately. I'm still having that problem where I capitalize the first and second letter of the sentence. I, I'm not a typist, definitely. But last year in July, and you can go back and you can look at it. Uh, it's at our website, obviously, uh, abfpdx.org. I talked specifically about how it is that we invest in relationships combined with what we had been given. Um, today, I'm going to kind of revisit that because we're going to talk about the same passage. And you all should be familiar with this. I'm sure uh, if you've spent any time in a church at all, you've heard about the parable of the talents. Uh, So Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Uh, This is is something that is instructive for all of us. Uh, Last year I stated uh, that we uh, we could spend like a ton of time just in this parable alone, and we would still only scratch the surface. And in fact, I, I did just give you kind of an overview last year and continue to talk about how we invest our talents specifically in growing relationships. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the, the, the talent that we are given itself and how we invest.
that's that. So the talent uh, that's talked about in Matthew 25, it, there's a couple of different things to look at here. First of all, uh, the talents that were given, it was a lot of money. Now, I haven't fully adjusted this for, for inflation, uh, but the estimated worth of the talent in silver was about $600,000. So the man that uh, gave one servant close to about $3 million in today's money. The next one he gave about $1.2 million, and the last one he gave about six hundred. dollars Quite a sum of money. Now, again, not adjusted for inflation. Uh, so, you know, that, that's complicated math. And though I do work for the IRS, I don't have to do math, and that should scare you. Okay. <laughs> Amen. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> I have a computer that does those things. Don't worry, Brian. It's all right. All right. So, some got more, some got less, but everybody got something right? Nobody was left out. All of them received not just a small bit, but they received a significant portion. It wasn't just a little bit, a tiny, minuscule amount. It was a significant amount, even in the least of it. You can also look at the uh, etymology of the word talent and how it's taken from this passage, uh, from the Greek talenton to the Latin talente. It has come to be used to mean talent as we know it today, which is a natural aptitude or skill. And so, though we focused on one aspect last year, we're going to scratch the surface of this parable again this year, today, and look in the context of what we have been given, our talents, our skills, and how that ties in to notoriety or to fame. So read with me, if you will, Matthew 25, uh, starting in verse 14 through 30. And uh, this is, uh, this is uh, Jesus teaching his disciples specifically. And he says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. <clears throat> called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. And then he left on his trip. Now the servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. And the servant with the two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master returned from his trip, and he called on them to give an account of how he had used his money. The servant to whom he had trusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise and said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let us celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. And the master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Come. Let us celebrate together. And then the servant with one bag of silver came forward and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. And I was afraid to lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew that I harvested crops I didn't plant, and gathered crops I didn't cultivate. Why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. And then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. They will have an abundance. But for those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw the useless servant into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
that's that's pretty horrible stuff right there. I would, So how does this relate to us? Jesus is teaching his disciples, and he's describing the kingdom of heaven as this. Well, praise God, through Jesus' sacrifice, we'll all, we're all part of the kingdom of heaven. Amen? We have received God's grace, and we can join in relationship with him without any barriers. All of us have been given talents, we've been given abilities, we've been given resources, skills, opportunities. All of these things that God has given, including our spiritual gifts. Anything that God has trusted you with, your children, your jobs, these are all talents that you have. Would it be so terrible to be known as the person that raised good children? Would it be so terrible to be known as someone who works hard? Some of us are afraid to peer into what it is that we've been given. We're afraid that we'll be found wanting, lacking in that. We never put our talents to use because we might fail. That fear, that failing, holds us back. It has a, a death grip on us, quite literally. Now, though the amounts may differ, everybody got something. In the parable that Jesus told, there's no such thing as no servant being There is only the any the only thing that we see is people actually receiving something. There is nothing written down where Oh, I, I'm, I'm like painting myself into a corner, right? The, I think you got it, right? Everybody receives something. We'll just stick with that. We'll go from the positive instead of from the negative. I never claim to be a great orator, people, okay? All right. Though the amount difference, everybody receives something. There's no such thing as a no-talent person. Everybody, everybody got at least one talent. And that talent, remember, as defined, including whatever inflation I've calculated it to, is a significant amount. In, uh, in Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, verse 6, the Bible tells us that in His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. We are, as individuals, unique. We've been given specific gifts, talents, skills, abilities, experience, traits, temperaments, all mixed in together to create you. Everybody has been created uniquely. You were known before you were knit in your mother's womb. There's an individual relationship that God has with you. That's amazing. And as a fellowship, we come together as individuals, as unique persons, and form this body. Now this body needs to have everything working well, right? If one thing is out of whack, we have, we have problems. I, you know, I have a, you know, Brittany was talking about just her diagnosis of an autoimmune disorder. I have an autoimmune disorder. Mine is specifically uh, my, my 
my antibodies are so powerful, so strong, right, that they attack themselves. Super strong, you know, disorder. <laughs> Super strong, guys. Okay. But, see, if one thing is out of whack, the body doesn't work properly. So if we take in uh, everything and we come to the fellowship together as, uh, as those unique individuals and we don't function properly, if we don't put in the work, if we don't do things, things are out of whack. We all have the potential to rise together as a body, but only if we each do our part and put our talents to work. There's an investment that God has made in our lives. And the Bible does tell us that at a certain point in time, there's going to be an audit. We will stand before God. We have been given all of this. And he will ask us, what have you done with this? Here's everything that I gave you. Now, what did you do with it? How have you used what you've been given? Have you taken time and invested in your talents and your skills and your experiences? There's, now, uh, there's an assumed risk, guys, right? Uh, the first servant that was given the, the five back, uh, he went out and he invested. There's, there's a risk that's involved in doing that. He could, have, he could have lost it all. He could have spent all of his talent that he was given. There's an assumed risk. And two of the servants were willing to assume the risk based off of faith. They knew, just like the third one, who their master was. The New American Standard Version tells us that the first servant immediately invests. He had an eagerness to set forth the task that had been placed in front of him. He had been given too well. He could handle everything that, was been, uh, everything that had been granted to him, everything that had been given. He put into his investment fully, eagerly, waiting for the return. The second also goes out and works to make more. Through work and investment, they were able to grow and even double what they had been given. Now remember, the first thing is they took account of what it is that they had, what they were given according to what it is that they could handle, so there was an understanding of what it is that they could do, what it is they had, how they could utilize what they had been given so that they could increase. So you have to, you have to take a hard look at what it is that you have. You have to look through your experiences, your life, and discover what skills, what talents that you have and how it is that you could properly utilize those. You have to understand what it is that God has given you and begin to eagerly work at investing it, putting it to work for him. Don't live in denial of what it is that you've been given. Don't neglect it or stay ignorant of it, but put it into practice. You can't run away from the purpose that God has put in your life. It doesn't work. The only thing that happens is you run yourself ragged and delay the inevitable. You can push it off. You can try your darndest. But when God has put a purpose for you in place, you will fulfill that purpose. It takes time. It takes investment, and it takes work. So you can either cause yourself more suffering, you can neglect 
what God has given you. You can fail to properly utilize those talents and those skills. All you're doing is causing yourself great pain. And when you are called into account, when it is time for that audit to take place, what is it that you're going to hear? Anytime we bury our talent, it's usually caused from one of three things. Self-doubt, right? I could never do that. I'm not qualified to do that. The fear of failure, right? Um, so how about, uh, let's see, some of you are still in school. How many times have you known the answer to the question but were afraid to speak out and give that answer? I got a few people that shake their head no. They're really confident. Great job. Doesn't affect my point, however, because I, you know, I have to admit, sometimes I'll be instructing the class because I'm an instructor for, for the Internal Revenue Service, and I'll be teaching a class, and I'll ask the question, and I know in my mind exactly what the answer is. I mean, I did all the prep work. I know everything. And then someone will say something different. And you're like, wait a second. Is that right? Does it correlate at all with what the truth is? And I have to make a decision right then and there if I say, eh, or I just say, nope. Praise God, I'm not afraid to say nope. Um, some of you may be afraid sometimes to put your life, your reputation on the line. If I say the wrong thing, I'm going to look like an idiot. I don't want to look stupid. So I'll let someone else take the heat. They'll answer, and then I'll laugh at them. Because that's the safe bet. That's really just self-reflection. That's self-doubt is what that is. Another reason is uh, self-pity. Oh, man, I've been wrong so many times. <laughs> I have failed so many times. I made an attempt at one time, and then I got, I got burned. I got burned. I did something completely wrong. I was so embarrassed. Woe is me. I cannot take that embarrassment again. Or I tried and I got burnt out. I tried so hard and got so far. So I'm not going to try anymore because it won't matter if I try anymore. Self-pity. Those are the type of people that watch the first episode of a new program and because it sucks, never watch the rest of it. Let's, let's, be, uh, let's be honest. There are a lot of pilot episodes that suck. They're bad. I watched a lot of TV in my youth. I, wasted in that regard. But what happens when you watch that next episode? In fact, we have a rule in, in my household. If we're going to watch one episode, we're going to watch at least two episodes. At least two episodes. And we look for the redeeming qualities in that. And we don't watch a lot of TV. Right now we're just watching a lot of, uh, you know, home and garden television, fixing up houses and stuff. That's pretty safe. They're all bad. And then they're tanned down and renovated and become good. It's guys, it's good. All right. All right. Um, <clears throat> there are two different ways that you can respond to failure, right? And fortunately for us, you know, we talked about this last week. The Bible speaks to our condition. So there are two great examples that are given of just, just failure, right? Look at, uh, look at Judas and Peter. 
right? Two examples of failure. Both of them denied Christ. And Judas, well, he let it get to him. He was so wrapped with guilt about his denial of Christ that he tried to give the money back. He was so wracked with guilt at his denial for Christ that he found his life to be wanting, and so he took his own life because he could not stand what he had done. And yet that very same evening, Peter, in a crowd, denied even knowing who Christ was. Not once, not twice, but three times. Now, Peter was racked with guilt as well. He wept bitterly, it says, but he picked himself up, and 50 days later, this same man that denied that he even knew who Christ was, that it betrayed him to even say, I don't know this man at all, was preaching in the streets and brought 3,000 people to a saving knowledge of who Christ was. There are two ways to respond to failure. The last thing that often affects how it is that we use our talents is self-consciousness. What will other people think? Right? In this world, we're really big on how people will take us, what we will think. Uh, You can look on, well, any given day on social media, one of the famous people, the elite, those of great notoriety will make a statement about something. And then sometimes that very same day, or even the next day, they will retract what it is they say because somebody somewhere became offended. And they can't bear, they can't bear to have somebody think poorly of them. They're so self-conscious about their image, it is so based on the value of other people and what they give to them, they cannot bear the thought of somebody saying, I don't like you. Oh, no. Proverbs says in Proverbs 29, 25, fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting in the Lord means safety. It's interesting. Fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting in the Lord means safety. It all comes down to where we actually find our value. We excuse ourselves from ministry by pointing to people who are more talented, saying, well, I could never be, I can never be what they are. I can never have the impact that they have. I can never be a great uh, orator. I could never be a great evangelist. I could never do good work. I can't bring people to God because I will, I'll fail. I'll be bad at it. So, I'll let them do it. They seem to have a voice. I'll let them do it. We fall into the trap that, that, only, people that should, the only people that should do anything are the people that are, that are the, the best at it, right? Only the professionals are the ones that should do anything. None of y'all are amateurs, right? Only the professionals. Now, I got to tell you something. By all accounts, I'm a professional speaker. My work pays me to talk, literally. And you've seen how I've done today. That should give you hope. I am a professional. Here's the thing. We are not called to be dull people sitting on the sidelines watching the events take place, afraid to participate, afraid to lose what little we have, what little we think that we can give. We're not called to bury our talents in the ground because we are afraid that we can't handle those, that they won't be returned safely. 
Because when it comes time for the audit, when the accounting comes, we will discover that we have been wicked and lazy servants. Fear has now ruled our lives, and we have become wicked and lazy. Fear causes me to make excuses for doing nothing. Well, um, I just, I knew you were a harsh man. I knew you were a harsh harsh man, and, and I just couldn't bear to lose what you had given me, so I buried it in the ground. See, the servant who was given the one talent said, Master, I knew you were hard, harvesting where you had not sown, and gathering what you had not scattered. He prepared a speech. He was ready to excuse his laziness. He spent all of his efforts in trying to diffuse the situation that he himself would cause. How many times have you gone through the monologues in your head where you try to figure out how the conversation you're about to enter into is going to go. And then you become so overwhelmed with the different permutations and the different outcomes that you say to yourself, I'm just going to sit here by the sidelines. I'm not going to participate. Every scenario is that one in what, six billion, blah, 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 right? I'm never going to hit that, so forget about it. The reason, the reason the man that was given little didn't make a profit was not because it was the master's fault, though he was prepared to blame him. You are a hard man. You reap what you don't sow. I was afraid of you. It wasn't his fault. He tries to pass the buck on to the master. See, God has given us the principle of utilization. He expects me to use what he has given to me. If I don't, it's not a casual thing. This is serious business, people. We are not called to sit on the sidelines. We are called to use what we have and to be known for something. It's flat out wrong to waste your life sitting on the sidelines, not involved, because you've chosen to be swallowed by fear. You have literally said, God, I trust you, but you're a hard master. I'm afraid. I'm so afraid that it's your fault that I do nothing. Come on, people, seriously. When you're using all that God has given you, you will find yourself receiving so much more. You want to be better at something? You're afraid you're not good enough? That your talent sucks? Oh, no. You might have to actually utilize it. And once you utilize it, Yeah, you may not do well. So you either hang yourself like Judas, or you redeem yourself like Peter, and you keep putting it into practice. Though Peter denied Jesus, he came back and he said, this is who Jesus is and you need to know it. When you use what you have been given when you become known for what it is that you do and who it is that gave it to you, you can bet that when you stand before God in the audit, you will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you more. And then the best part comes after that, right? Let's celebrate. We are not called to forget about our achievements or our accomplishments or how our talents have grown, how our skills have grown. Those things feed in to who it is that we are. Those are what we were 
created to express. And those expressions point the way to the one who gave us those things. How dare you try to hide that? Why would you bury it? Why would you cover it up? Why would you dim the light of the shining? Why? Proper use of your talent brings affirmation. Well done, my good and faithful servant. It brings promotion. I'm going to give you even greater responsibility. You've done well with the little. Here's more. And then celebration. Come and share in the master's happiness. The happiest people are the ones that are using their talents for God. Putting into practice what he has given you. Being famous. Do not make the mistake of burying what God has given you. Put to use every little bit of talent and every achievement. These are gifts. They are gifts that need to be recognized. And through the recognition of your achievements, through the talent that God has given you, you can be a powerful force for him. Throughout well, Portland, right? Throughout the United States, throughout the, the entire world, there's no stopping the master. We are blessed tremendously, and he only wants to bless us more. Your talent, your claim to fame, what you are known for, your notoriety, is a blessing when it is put on display as a shining light, as a shining example, guiding those who are lost, enriching their lives, showing them who God is. Though you may fail, Rebound, just like Peter. So I'm going to give you some questions to ponder as we go to cell group. But before we go to cell group, remember we're going to do uh, our pumpkin gram distribution. But in the meantime, I'll give you these questions so you can start to think, and then we'll break into cell groups right after pumpkin grams. So first question, what has God given you talent in? So I need you to examine your lives. Look at what it is that you were talented at. Because there's an, an understanding that we need to take account of what it is that we've been given. So what has God given you talent in? And then we need to look at our proper utilization, right? So how have you used what he has given you? How has, have you used what God has given you? And thirdly, how is it that you can best utilize what you are famous for? How is it that you can best utilize what you are famous for? So those three questions should hopefully spark some conversation for you, some self-examination, hopefully some empowerment to do boldly with what God has given you to do. Don't be afraid. I, I was about to throw another quote in. Fear is the mind killer. Anyways. Let's go ahead and uh, prepare for cell groups. First, we have pumpkin grams. <laughs> 